What glamorized career path is actually a complete nightmare? Film crew. Yes, you sometimes meet famous people. Sometimes they're cool, often they're really not. The days are 14 plus hours of work with a commute, of who knows how long on either end, depending where you're shooting. You have half an hour for lunch. Coffee breaks are whenever you're not needed on set, so depending on your job, I was in camera, and we rarely had a down moment, it could be almost never. More often than not, someone on set is yelling. People lose their minds over making really shitty entertainment. You start work by 7am on Monday, and by Friday you're coming in at 4pm, and leaving when the sun comes up on Saturday. There are no paid holidays, no paid sick days, no paid vacation. If you don't work enough qualifying hours, the union kicks your health care. And this is, if you're in a union. Non-union, much worse. Sexual harassment is through the roof, but the kids who get it the worst are afraid to say anything, or they'll lose their jobs. I have been told some real horror stories about famous actors, some of whom I still haven't seen get outed by the Me Too movement. And I'm not talking word of mouth, secondhand stories. I'm talking about young women who whisper to each other what shows to avoid and make them sweat and never use their name, because if they want to work in this industry, they can't be known as a troublemaker. I watched so many co-workers fall into addictions, lose family, miss their children's lives, over the dumbest TV shows in the world. If you go union, the money can be good, but it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Law enforcement. I went into it with the naive belief I would be making a difference. I wanted to protect people and make my community safer. Instead, I got to see the worst humanity has to offer day in and day out. Let's see if I can list all the negatives. Most departments are filled with arrogant as holes with inflated egos that love to condescend to other officers or the public when they themselves can barely read. Many officers have severe anger issues and love to take it out on the public, never saw it happen physically but verbally or by issuing ever ticket possible. Try to suggest changes to bring about better relations with the public. Prepare to be ostracized and bullied till you toe the line. The overall level of incompetence is staggering, with some officers barely knowledgeable of the firearms they carry every day. Your view of the public and people in general becomes very dark. The amount of EDPs, emotionally disturbed persons, druggies and alcoholics you deal with each day is ridiculous, and you start to wonder how society hasn't collapsed. You arrest a violent offender, just to see them quickly released over and over. What's worse is how many times an abuse victim files a complaint, because you arrested their love despite almost being killed. Very few people are actually grateful when you cut them a break. They do take it as a sign of weakness and try to push the envelope. This is an often overlooked reason why some officers become as holes. You try to help people out and they spit in your face, sometimes literally. This gradually tears you down until you can barely recognize what you are becoming. The uniform is a target. You can be the nicest most patient officer in the world, but to many the uniform means you are the enemy. You will get cursed at, attacked and have your private life laid bare. Low pay not even remotely commensurate with what you have to deal with. There is so much more, but I was lucky enough to get out and change careers before it all really got to me. This is kind of niche, but, scuba dive instructor. I did it for 3 ish years. I can't begin to tell you how many times people wished they had my job. A decent portion of the job was selling. I hate forcing people to buy things, but I had to have a certain percentage of people buy a mask, at least. The mask was about 25% of the cost of an open water course. Chances are they'd never use it again. Dive shop politics are insane. I worked 6.5 days a week for 90% of the year. If I turned down a course, I wouldn't be given another until there were no other instructors available. If there were no courses going on, I still had to be in the shop in case someone came in. During slow times there would be 7 or 8 instructors hanging around doing nothing. We all lived less than 5 minutes away. My dive shop would only hire people who were attractive enough. They'd also refuse to hire people who had trained at certain other dive schools in the area. The owners would go out of their way to be charming to the customers and then take the piss out of them as soon as they were out the door. The amount of responsibility is huge, and nobody even thinks about it, until you point it out. 
You're taking four people into a deadly environment and have to bring them back in the same state they went into it in. If something goes wrong you can lose your license or go to jail. Where I was working, these were pretty exclusively early to mid 20 year olds. Not only that, but if someone you trained has an incident at a later date, you can also be investigated and possibly prosecuted. I was diving in 30 C, 86 F, water. I constantly had an infection. Could be from a small cut, or my ears or my throat. It was constant. Long, very hard work days 12 hour days were about the norm. I'd teach, be dragging around the tanks I was responsible for weighing 20 kilograms each as well as tons of other gear, and putting on my be happy around the customer, face whilst keeping them from dying. It's like a combo of retail and warehouse work. It also diluted my love of diving. Even when diving with professionals now I have a hard time not constantly being on alert, waiting for someone to do something stupid, rather than enjoying the dive. Pay is dog sheet. It's an amazing job, but it turned my hair grey by 25. Scientific research first you bust your as an undergrad to get accepted to a good grad school. If you're like me and did biology, that means you're going to be taking the same classes and stressing out about a lot of the same stuff as pre-meds. Then you go to grad school which lasts on average 5 to 8 years in the sciences. That's most or all of your 20s spent making dollar sign 26k slash year on a student stipend. But hey, at least school is free. Then after you graduate you've got your PhD and can go work, right? Not really. If you're extremely should play the lotto lucky, then yes, you'll get a coveted research job. If you're like the vast majority of people, however, you'll be forced to get a postdoc position. That's where you work under a professor in a lab, just like you always have, and get paid a whopping dollar sign 40k slash year. They also last for only 1 to 2 years, and once it's up it's time to try to get a real career job again, or, more likely, apply for yet another postdoc. People can be stuck postdoc in for 10 plus years. This is the first real piece of the nightmare. Turns out twice as many PhDs graduate every year than there are jobs available for them in the sciences. That means there's a ton of competition all vying for the same tiny handful of professorships. What about industry? You say. Industry has even fewer openings and is a pipe dream foremost since they only want practical experience and skills. You're also still working under someone, unlike being a professor, where you're free to explore any interest you want, kind of. So most people go for being a professor, where the average opening gets 200 to 300 extremely well qualified candidates. But maybe you get lucky, and get your job as an assistant professor, entry level. You're now making dollar sign 60k slash year, and you better bust your as getting tenure, because if you don't meet your tenure requirements by the time you have your tenure hearing, after about 5 to 7 years at most places, you're fired. And the problem with that is, a typical part of tenure requirements is getting 1 to 2 R01 grants, the grant name is only relevant for biology, I have no clue what the physics slash chemistry slash etc equivalents are, the R01 is a big grant considered to be the bread and butter grant for research. Too bad its funding rate is around 10%. Go to a scientific conference and chat with people, and I guarantee you will have no problem at all finding scientists with stories of applying for that grant for years with no success. Now let's say you do miraculously make it past that hurdle, and get bumped up to associate professor. Now you're making dollar sign 75k slash year and things are smoother sailing. Think you can stop worrying about grants? Ha. Even if you work at a university that still has real tenure, that is, can't be fired, they probably have a clause in there about you funding your own salary through grant money. So no grants equals no salary. Even better, as you have your own lab, you're also the person funding your workers' salaries. So if you lose too much grant money, you have to fire everyone. This happens all of the time, even to great labs. Finally, if you've had a successful career, then around the time you're in your 50s or 60s you'll get promoted to full professor, where you will finally make dollar sign 100k slash year. It's worth noting that scientists' work lives are stressful. Working weekends and holidays is common. Working late is very common. You screw up one detail in an experiment and you may have just thrown away months of work. You are constantly stressing out if you'll reach the next goal or not. 
Will I get into grad school? Will I finish grad school? Will I ever get a professorship? Will I ever get grant money? Etc. You get exposed to dangerous stuff like radiation, biohazards, chemical hazards, carcinogens, hell. I've even been in rooms that had magnet hazard signs up. Don't do science kids. Pharmacist. Yeah, the pay, used to be, amazing and jobs, used to be, plentiful, but the reality is this. 1. Good luck finding a job in any area, that is remotely livable slash interesting. Oversaturation has destroyed job opportunities and advancement opportunities. 2. Job security is non-existent. Hordes of new grads with mountains of debt are willing to take your job for a fraction of what seasoned professionals make. 3. Congratulations, you're now apparently the drug police. You will spend the majority of your time dealing with calculating day supply for controlled substances, to ensure no early fills, and sifting through scripts to weed out fakes, you know, so you don't lose your license, and, therefore, your ability to provide for your family. 3a, you will be physically threatened by drug addicts and Karens literally every day, when you refuse to fill their controls early, or when you refuse to fill clearly fraudulent scripts. Sorry, your drug addiction is your problem and there is no way I will jeopardize my license by breaking the law, so you can fill yours and X bars and arcs early. 3b, the people who threaten you for not filling their bullshit scripts will call corporate to complain. They will then be issued a gift card for their troubles and you will get a stern lecture from your district manager who may or may not have a college degree, let alone have spent 8 years getting the required education to be a practicing pharmacist. 4. Hope you don't like lunch breaks or using the bathroom when you need to go because you will literally be too busy to eat, drink, or even piss during your shift 5. Fuck your personal life and safety because the pharmacy needs to be open no matter what. Blizzard. Fuck you, you're going in. Hurricane. Fuck you, you're going in. Wife going into labor. Fuck you, you're going in, and you'll be fired if you don't show up. I'm grateful every day that I got out of that sheety faking rat's nest of a bullshit profession, and that I can actually eat lunch daily and take a faking piss when I need to. Trades. Welder. Pipe fitter, electrician, etc., which Reddit loves to glamorize as an alternative to basically any other job because of the pay. I'm not in a trade, but my family members are, and it is some of the most grueling and crazy work out there. They've been in dangerous situations like solar panels flying away during an Arista or Lax fire safety at a nuclear power plant. They've worked crazy amounts of overtime just trying to meet impossible deadlines. My husband has been lucky, but when my dad was in the union he would get laid off and be out of work for months, where he would do side work. The alternative to this is working at out of range jobs and being away from home for months at a time. They take a toll on your body, my husband will most likely need a knee replacement and my dad had to retire early due to his health. Working for yourself is all well and good if you can balance your own books, maintain your code slash licenses and are insured, all while homie are winners freak out at the price for rewiring their 1930s fire trap house. I feel like Reddit tries to paint trades as these simple jobs that anyone can do with easy pay when there's a lot more that goes into it. It's not just your ability to weld, hang drywall or wire, but understanding and remembering code requirements, safely using all of your tools, and keeping yourself sane while you figure out how we are going to finish all this in a week. I still think anyone should give it a try, if they really want to, just understand that it's harder work than people like to think about. I don't think my husband would do anything differently, but I know my dad actively steered me away from a trade as a kid. Non-profit sector. You're mostly putting a band-aid on issues. You go into it wanting to help people, but far too many people are ungrateful, not willing to help themselves, or complain no matter how much you're trying. I cannot tell you how many people have made threats, even when you've gone well above and beyond for them. So many people abuse the system for freebies. I had people come in trying to get freebies who make over 100k a year. The pay is always sheet, unless you're at the executive level. It is ridiculous how much executives make compared to the workers doing 90% of the work. The CEO of my organization makes well into the six figures, while we have to work three years to get a 3% raise on our low salary. They also devalue you constantly. 
you have people with master's degrees working entry-level positions being bossed around by some old lady with zero education, but who's friends with the CFO or something. You're constantly working with a ramen noodle budget expected to come out with steak and lobster results 9 tenths volunteers are only there because they are trying to get hours or a reference and complain a lot. You're constantly battling other non-profits, even if you're just trying to share resources, you can do completely different things. And are just trying to refer clients back and forth, so they can access all available resources, but they'll guard their clients like gold. The amount of shady practices that occur as well. Inflation of numbers, total lies, etc. It is really sad how many places do nothing or very minimal, but are glamorized as doing good. Edit, thanks for the love. Veterinarians. I'm not one, but I worked as tech support for a couple of years in one, and here is the cycle they go through. Young shiny person loves animals, wants to work with them, gets appropriate degrees and a load of student debt hit industry, and learn that the industry is swamped. All those roles which involve you cooing at cute pets in surgeries in cities for well paid and caring owners, are occupied by the previous generation of vets who have no intention of moving anytime soon. The one place there are vacancies? Large animal practices in the rural areas. No emotional attachment to the animals at all. Grumpy farmers as owners who want to spend the least amount of money possible. To keep costs low, you will end up working and paid overtime, or doing favors on the side. When you factor these extra hours in, you realize your salary comes out to less than minimum wage. Work becomes a never-ending badly paid hellscape. And out of work. You're in a rural community. There is no nightlife. There are very few people your age. The people that are there have been there for decades and don't open up to anyone who moved in before the millennium. The internet is dodgy. You are miles from your friends and family and have no time or money to spend going to see them what you do, have lots of access to. Ketamine. So many young vets leave the industry broken, addicted or dead from odd. It's well known in industry, but never spoken of out of it. Don't do it. Musician. Everyone knows the money is sheet, but people think you either starve early and give up, or you're talented, and you break out. Not so. There are normal music jobs out there. Unfortunately, they are subject to the following constraints. Nobody who hasn't also trained for 20 years knows whether you're doing a good job. Many of them don't either. The products produced by the music industry have value. The services involved in producing those products can't easily be assigned a value. As a result, you have no leverage in pay negotiations. Everyone ignores wage laws, and nobody is interested in enforcing them. The government never enforces them, there is only effective unionism in the US and UK, whereas, for instance, in Australia, musicians are represented by the same union which represents actors and journalists, which laughs at the idea of giving a sheet about musicians. This includes things like state and federal minimum wage overall, not just the sector minimum. It's not uncommon to be making approximately $5 an hour, to be working your ass off constantly without breaks. You will eventually be able to find work that pays above minimum wage. It will have nowhere near full time hours. You will do as many unpaid hours as you do paid hours, minimum. Sometimes you will do 2x as many. Opera singing. The famous Mariah Callas said, if she could do it all over again, she wouldn't. Takes countless years, hundreds of thousands of dollars, hard to hold a day job due to rehearsals, bouncing from place to place to place. People in music don't always consider you to be a musician. People with regular jobs constantly asking you what your real career is, or they do the polar opposite and think you're some famous diva when in fact you aren't. Incredibly difficult to keep long-term relationships due to the constant travel. You literally pay hundreds of dollars for job interviews, since that's what auditions are. You perform most holidays, since Christmas and Easter are the prime biblical times which equals lots of singing and I means operetta or a salute to Vienna, where you sing Johann Strauss Jr. all night. It's rarely fur shawls and champagne, and you work in the evenings and sleep in the day. It makes it difficult if you have a family, especially a young family, because you have to decide if you work on Christmas to help pay for things or you stay home to open presents. It's a string of tough decisions. It's taxing and a lot of people take breaks. 
It's truly a passion that drives you forward, because it's hard and thankless and less and less people support it. You really gotta love what you do. Opera is the meeting of all the art forms, music, visual art, dance, literature, and acting. Please give it a shot before dismissing it. Please support the arts. Any form of professional acting. High school and community theater is fine. There's drama and people fight, but all in all, you come together. On a college slash professional level though, it gets nightmarish fast. You constantly have to maintain your appearance. Too many pounds lost or gained and people treat you differently. You have to keep your social life extremely close to your chest or people will use it against you. Everyone, with few exceptions, is a double agent. They'll play friendly and interested in you and the second you open up to them, they'll use it against you. Most importantly, gossip reigns supreme. It won't matter what the truth is. If someone starts a rumor about you and it spreads far enough, it can ruin your professional life. At best, you'll still be able to find a bit of work. At worst, you'll end up blacklisted over a lie. I went from being a top actor in my department to being a stagger hand because someone spread my personal issues around. I'm not saying to avoid acting if it's your passion. It has wonderful highs and traumatic lows. But if you insist on becoming an actor, here are some tips to keep your sanity. Make friends outside of your career path. Find people who love you for you and won't mess with your career if you piss them off. Find a therapist you trust. There will be a lot of people picking at you for your personality and appearance. Having someone to help you keep sight of yourself is invaluable. Most importantly, keep a thick skin. This one sounds easy. It isn't, which is why you'll need the other two to fall back on. Someone will always have something to critique you on. Someone will always have something negative to say about you. If the criticism is warranted, use it. If someone is trying to tear you down, distance yourself from them. Mortician. I worked as one for three years. Long hours, abysmal pay, insane politics, emotional burnout. Now I'm not saying morticians are back quote glamorized, but when you see them on TV you think they are just quirky people who get to find out how people died. Morticians don't do that, that's a medical examiner. Mortician life sucks. So if you're the you would goth girl or guy who wants to be a mortician to be around corpses, stop. First of all, cringe. Second of all, it's not exciting. You do tons of grunt work. It's monotonous and you listen to people cry, or you smell formaldehyde all day, and are chained to a table embalming. Being a mortician isn't quirky or fun. Yes, it can be rewarding in the sense that helping people is great. So I love that aspect of my job. But the long hours on call, being woken up at 2am to pick up a body hearing people scream and sob, I became so burnt out of hearing crying that at one point I almost slammed my office door and screamed for the people to shut up just to stop hearing hysterics for hours on end. Looking at physical trauma on bodies and smelling it cleaning up poop and pee is a large portion of the job lifting dead bodies and caskets. Heavy F, office politics, especially if the funeral home is family owned seeing dead children and babies seeing the bodies of people too sad to be alive there for killing themselves seeing the bodies of those murdered. Domestic violence ones always upset me the most, because if their eyes were still open I could still see fear. Maybe that's projection, but it made me sad. And you could usually see old scars and marks from years of abuse, but also jewelry that said love you happy 5th anniversary, as if buying gifts made it okay. Dealing with the law and lawyers dealing with family drama of the next of kin standing in the sun for hours at a graveside burial with no shade or water and you're in a suit hauling flowers around and getting pollen all over you driving. Tons of driving taking people's money. Telling someone that, if they want to have a grand ceremony, that it will be $10,000 for something that really costs easily half that or less, faking despicable. If you like that aspect, you're twisted. Families go into debt over this sheet. I used to give things away when I could, and I encouraged people to buy online for things like caskets or urns when possible so it's cheaper. Getting screamed at by angry families dealing with the press when the death was newsworthy. Staying till 10 or later to work a visitation and getting up at 6 the next morning 
to take the body to church doing tons of paperwork and contracts having sales quotas standing all day or sitting all day there seems to be no in between and more will all kill your soul. Now I can't speak for every mortician, but I don't think I'm entirely wrong, because this industry is fairly standard though not entirely, so there's room for differences. I know I just sound like a jerk, but this job wears you to your core. I truly loved my job, and I would do it again to help people. I fought tooth and nail for the families. But the way the industry exploits you, especially if you're young, I started at 19 over 20, is horrendous. Dead bodies aren't the worst part of the job, but the feeling, like you want to die, those are the worst. Depression, anxiety and addiction are super prevalent. People are exhausted and just desperate for a break. And dealing with a death while in Deathka? Forget about it. I've had some managers complain that a person who lost multiple people in one year was taking back quote too much time and it's back quote inconvenient. And others that were good about it. You're expected to be a robot. Don't cry don't feel bad don't feel anything just work, just apathy. I always say that once you don't feel a bit sad seeing a dead child, it's time to leave the industry. Luckily I still had humanity in me, so I didn't leave due to apathy. This job isn't for the quirky goths. This job is for those that can tough it out long enough, or for those privileged with connections to management. I toughed it out, and I do miss the families I helped, and the hugs they'd give me, but right now, fuck funeral homes. Commercial pilot. My brother, who's currently an A380 pilot for British Airways, has had an interesting start to his career to say the least. So first up is everyone wants to be a pilot so, before you even apply you need to get your CV looking, like flying is your entire life. He worked at a local aerodrome doing aircraft moving, refueling, basic repairs, you name it, he did it work for a year. He got given about 15 hours of flying from people there over the year. Whilst doing that, he was also in the air training corps doing his gliding and flying scholarships, 50 hours of winch gliders, and powered flights with a solo flight at the end of each course. Once he did that he applied as one of 3000 applicants for 8 positions in this flight training school. That's just for the right to be trained, which he got after 4 rounds of interviews and aptitude testing. Then he had to take out a pounds 120k loan against our dad's house to actually pay for the training. Two years of training later, with the number of tests he had to retake or drop out entirely, he got his license. Amazing. Then the volcano in Iceland sheets the bed and causes billions in damage to the European airline economy, including a number of airline layoffs. Now there are no new pilot positions for another year roughly, during which time my bro has to keep his corporal current which costs almost pounds 20k in total with sims and training. This comes from family. My bro got a job doing basic it work in the head office for the training company he trained with. This meant he was able to be there every single day asking the employment desk for any new positions. They had a contract with a number of airlines that they would be given X amount of positions of the total made available. A year later, he gets a job with Bay City Fla, flying from London City as his base of operations. The pay was pounds 26k a year, in London, and he had to pay back his loan still at 800 pounds per month. Safe to say it was another 3 years of us helping him out with food etc. Now it settled down once he reached 5000 hours which is like the point at which you can get positions with other airlines. He applied for Bay, and got in as first officer. From there he did 5 years, and then applied for long haul on the A380 which he got, and is now FO on that amazing aircraft, but yeah holy shit it's expensive and hard. Automotive technician. First off cars are getting more and more advanced each year. You never stop having to learn what some engineer dreamed up to justify their pay. Second, the computer tells you what's wrong. No, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. The common misconception is the computer runs a diagnostic. In practice, each code is a maze you must solve using gasp your experience, knowledge, and brain. It's a starting point that tells you what maze you are in, that's it. No magic wand of diagnostic goodness. Third, that diagnostic only pays you so much. If it kicks your ass you still hay paid X amount. No extra time for you having to learn the magnetic ride control. Have fun. Fourth. Because their grandpa slash dad did it under a shade tree it's easy. 
Technicians. Note I'm not using the word mechanic. Have you be able to properly troubleshoot electrical systems? Did you know that on average a new car has more than 40 computers in it that all talk to each other? Fifth. You're dumb because you work on cars. This one pisses me off the most. Let me tell you something about the rocket surgery I do on a daily basis, so Karen can get her frap from Starbucks. This sheet is hard. I cannot stress this enough. One computer in a modern car has exponentially more power than the Apollo rockets had. Sixth. Turning a profit. So in order to be successful you have to have the ability to think for yourself and be fast at it. But Karen wants to bring me a part off Amazon that one third of the time doesn't work, then for them being cheap wants me to put another one in for free. Yeah no. Seventh. Auto manufacturers are making vehicles more complicated while also cutting the amount of labor they pay under warranty. So yeah be smarter and get paid less. Good lesson. Eighth. The hours. So as a tech you get paid on billable hours. Industry calls this flag hour. Water pump pays 2.3 hours and it takes you all day because a bolt decided to break off in the timing cover. Sorry 2.3 hours and maybe an extra hour for the 6 hours of hell you went through to get the bolt out. Plus staying late to get things finished to make enough money to make ends meet. Ninth. Constantly fixing something someone else either a uh, faked up or b did half assed. It gets old. Just let me fix it in the first place instead of paying some poor kid on Craigslist that doesn't know what a phase detractor is. If you are still reading congrats getting to the end of my rant. Sorry for being a sourpuss, but damn it gets old. <laughs> Judging by this thread I guess working in tech, web dev slash stat, isn't so bad then. You get paid pretty well and there are more jobs than people who can do them so, if your place is sheet you can pretty easily move on. You will do this at least every 18 months anyway, because the easiest way to get promoted is to go elsewhere. Same for pay rises too. You need to be loyal to yourself primarily and understand unless you are the exact perfect fit you will never have a forever job. I got a 10,5k pay rise just by going to work somewhere else though closer to 15 with the benefits. Main downsides are when you work near to admin workers who have sheety conditions rather than ask to have the same as you. Flexible hours, paid conferences, work from home. They tend to get upset and just whinge. I'd be happy if they got the same TBH. Jobs pretty sweet though. Mostly only a pain in the as when product gets involved and stops you doing necessary infra stuff because it doesn't convert to a cash value also most of the work you do will be putting someone else out of a job and society doesn't yet have the infrastructure to support this level of automation. When we build self service tools we tend to just fire people rather than making their lives easier. A lot of the time you'll just spend thinking, and when you work somewhere that values you, you do very little actual work and most of it is thinking about your solution. It's pretty good how learning if mostly encouraged, and you need to do it, so you can stay up, to date with other places. Some places don't support this, so it lets you know you need to leave, because if you stay you'll fall behind. Also for the salary you get you can end up getting nonsense hobbies like Warhammer or Magic or whatever and it not being an issue. I tend to just do expensive courses and then factor it into my next pay review request so I can claim it back the hard way. You do need to be comfortable with the idea that absolutely no knows what is going on. You especially and some people are just good at pretending they know what's going on. Working from home is a great, but you generally feel under a lot of pressure to be productive, and you kind of just aren't. Some things we have kinda stink, but mostly it's weirdo politics, or just our own mental ideas of what we are doing. If you get me, I think with teaching kids to code now in school, that the bubble will end in the next 10 years or so. So make sure you get into management, something super faking technical, or like an agile coach or w slash e also there are so many absolute grifters, especially at conferences. You'll spend time repeating yourself a lot cause some of your ideas are just hard to parse, but also a lot of incompetent people can get into your org and this can make your life more difficult especially. When you're senior to them, your success is based on their success, mostly it's good though, you know. I'd recommend it, especially software testing mostly the same money as development, but there is a better community and you're kind of unofficially unionized due to that. 
Cause it's a culture built by self-taught college dropouts it's pretty fun, would recommend. I was a musician for a long time. I worked cheaty service jobs while I was home and toured a few months a year and made records I really loved. My band eventually ended up on a mid-sized indie label and we had a pretty awesome run before all of us got older and couldn't justify being broke and gone all the time I had friends that really went at it as a career and maybe it doesn't kill the passion but you certainly have to apply it a different way. You play local shows. It's fun. You patch together a regional tour. It's a blast. Do the US a couple time and maybe even make it to Europe and see your record when about in magazines fuck yeah. You sign to a big label. You need a publicist. You can't get a real career going because you're constantly leaving for tour. You need a lawyer to look over contacts. You can't book your own tours anymore because you've outgrown the all ages clubs and basement scene and you look for a booking agent who may or may not give a sheet about you and sends you off for weeks at a time with bands you dislike. Your publicist insists you have a story and talks you up in a way that makes you sound full of yourselves. You go from the big band on a small label to the small band potentially getting lost in the shuffle on a big label. The label is on you to perform as in sell record slash stream slash whatever. Your approach to writing changes because this is your livelihood, whereas your old records had a certain purity to them that you're not likely to replicate again. You don't write music when you're inspired. You're on a touring slash recording cycle, so you get to work. You forget where you are, since you sleep in the van most of the time driving between shows. My roommate was in a huge band. They were on a relentless touring cycle. They'd do see markets headlining then go out as support with a certain kind of band, go overseas, come back and do support for a different genre headliner, go to Europe, and do the festival circuit in the summer, etc. Point and do that for two years. He wouldn't be home for more than two weeks at a time. He was sort of a perfect roommate in that respect. When they finally got home they'd get into writing slash recording mode and write a record, record it and have a new record to tour on and start the cycle again. I know people in bands that are household names. It's their job and most of them hate one another past a certain point after being in such close quarters with them for years. The thing is, it's hard to quit. If you do a new project you usually have to start over and also deal with naysaying fans that want you to write their favorite record over and over. Graphic design. In the movies, creative person gets genius idea, executes it, everyone goes oh wow that's amazing, and they get paid a ton of money. I roll. Creative person gets confusing, vague brief. Does several comps. I used to do one I loved, one middle of the road one I knew would be acceptable to the client, and one awful one, just to draw the sheety remarks that clients seem to think they have to say in order to do their jobs. Client says something like, I like this one, but it's not quite right. And their input is incredibly vague. That green is too happy, that kind of thing. Designer spends hours psychologically clawing out more detailed feedback from client, which usually boils down to, too much white space, not enough jazzy icons, and I want you to put a picture of my dog in the piece, or some such crap. My favorite client request of all time was I want you to draw a cartoon monkey that looks like that little black boy on TV, you know, the smart one, Urkel. I drew the monkey. It's still in use as the icon for a help desk system for a Fortune 500 company. After all this, designer executes on the severely compromised brief, does their best to accommodate the client, while arguing for better typography, white space, some faking restraint for Christ's sake, and eventually gives up, and does what the client wants because rent exists. And then the client says, I can't afford to pay you this month, but the exposure you'll get when I get VC funding is going to be great. Creative goes home, takes drugs, cries. This isn't glamorized, Peresi. When the push began for people to go to trade school because it is faster and some trades, plumbers, electricians, can make serious bank, welding was often listed as lucrative. So my son went and got his welding certification. One of his classmates got a job making serious money welding pipeline. His first week another welder got blown 100 foot because not all vapors were gone. My son's friend quit, said it wasn't worth serious injury or his life to have a job that started at 
$20 hour. The jobs my son has found so far starting in welding shops, welders have a high risk of lung cancer, among other issues, start between $10 to $12, remember Walmart starts people at $11, with raises pretty quickly the first year getting you to a little over dollar sign 30k slash year. Only high risk or highly specialized welders make a really decent income, we are still encouraging him to consider additional specialization. He ended up at a factory running a computerized welder making rolling tool chests. Though it helps to know about welding, he could have gotten that job straight out of high school. They do have pretty nice benefits, to be honest. He doesn't realize how bad some companies treat their people these days. He is only making $28k a year though, not the money talked about all over the place. Excuse my English. Medical doctor, especially in the surgery field 12 hours a day is the norm, you get also 24 hour shifts, no personal life, no time or energy for gym or hobbies. Responsibility and stress, sometimes I can't sleep the night thinking, if the kid I operated on will bleed, because I was a bit too fast in closing up. I'm still a resident, did about 4 years of general surgery and traumatology, I needed just another 2 years. To be board certified specialist in Germany, one day I had a 24 hour shift, and then I had to go in op. Liver segment resection, about 9 hours, after that I couldn't walk anymore, I had a ruptured ligamentum fibularis in the right foot, no trauma nothing, just through exhaustion, I healed alright, and changed my residency to urology, I still have lots of operations, and do a lot of shifts, but I love the new robotics and endoscopic operations. Feels like my childhood, when I had time to play video games. To be honest not just me, but lots of my colleagues always think, if we can just quit and work something else, but we've been doing what we are doing years now, and I think we don't have any skill or patience to do something else. At least I have no debts and the pay is good, I also get 6 weeks paid vacation a year so not too bad, but I never recommend my job to any kid that asks, I always recommend doing something else like it software developer or something similar. Video game industry. Every young college student thinks it would be awesome to work for a video game company. It's usually not, doubly so if it's one of the big ones. Entry level ca you will be playing the same section of a game over and over again. Imagine playing one level of Mario for 8 hours a day, 5 days a week. Not the full game, just that one section. And it's an incomplete level, so the level will likely be missing much of the blocks and coins that will gradually be added in over the course of weeks. But you've still got to play it despite it being unfinished and write reports on every single error and bug you find so the programmers can fix it. The programmers likely think it'll be something cool and glamorous, but it'll be basically the same as any other office job. You'll have a cubicle, you'll have to attend numerous meetings as the direction of the game changes. Based on feedback from the cat testers, you will be given difficult goals with little budget and push 50, 60 plus hours a week during crunch, which can last several months as they try to get the game ready for day one launch, because the release date was already set. Larger companies you will likely be more of a cog in the machine, with your role very specialized, and work only on certain aspects of the game. Meaning your work will become very repetitive, since you don't wear multiple hats. Above all else you are pretty much disposable as well, at least at the lower levels, because the glamour of the industry will attract 10 fresh from college replacements who will be happy to leap at the job, if you are gone. Thus your pay will also be less than industry standard, since there are so many who want the position. Being a chef. Now hear me out. I know that people get a glimpse of the stress involved with kitchen work through shows featuring Gordon Ramsay and other celebrity chefs, and I respect and appreciate those chefs. However, I also see and hear a lot of people talking about making it in the industry like you eventually will live the dream and have an army of underlings or have a small kitchen that is busy, but you get to do whatever you want or become a celebrity chef. This is completely false in my experience. I started washing dishes when I was 16, cooking on a restaurant line at 17, began my apprenticeship at 18, went to school also at 18, became a sous chef at 19, a corporate chef at 21, and burned out slash changed careers at 24, so I wouldn't lose my love and passion for cooking. 
In my culinary management program, everyone, including myself, had these delusions of grandeur, where they would travel the world with nothing but their chef whites and taste what all these exotic countries had to offer. Not a single one of the 90 people in my class did that. I know this, because only 25-ish of them made it to graduation, myself not included, and am in contact with almost all of them through Facebook still. And this was just one generation in one school in Ontario. If you are lucky, and can avoid the crippling alcoholism, that walks hand in hand with the industry. Then you will still be consistently overworked, and underpaid in a highly demanding career. And you can be replaced at the drop of a hat, so you will overwork yourself trying to stand out from the crowd for a promotion that you may never receive. If the owner of your workplace is also the head chef that has no desire to retire or hand over the reins. Being a chef I'm not sure it's so much glamorized since the passing of chef Anthony Bourdain. However during the early zeros there was a big surge in the cooking programs, Hell's Kitchen, Kitchen Nightmare etc. I feel like people took Gordon's attitude as humorous and decided it was something fun to get into. Many of the cooks I've worked with over the years didn't make it. Between working Kloppens, closing the restaurant at 2 to 3 a.m. then being back for open at 9 a.m. or the double shifts working 9 a.m. till 12 a.m. These all happen regularly. And when I say regularly I don't mean on a predictable schedule. I mean you walk in on a Tuesday morning expecting to be an easy day, only to find out 15 minutes before you're done the closer isn't coming in, and they need you to work till close, because all the other PPL working are teenagers in high school, because the owner is too cheap to pay people that are actually qualified to be able to feed themselves with a fork, let alone operate a grill, while worrying about Karen's well done steak. To top all this off you can't complain, because kitchens are very militaristic, and in the industry everybody knows each other, and it's extremely easy to get blackballed, and good luck trying to prove it. Remember those cheap owners I was mentioning before? Yeah they come back with a vengeance messing with your food cost, or recipes, or they try to micromanage. Want to open up your own restaurant, to avoid the hassle of working for someone else? Well now those doubles have turned to triples. Your salary has turned into a pittance, and something like two thirds of restaurants close in the first two years. Not to mention the years it took to get to the stage where you're this stressed out. For me I worked under six different chefs for 12 years three, of which were likely certified psychos that would scream at you if you didn't use a full teaspoon of salt in the water you were boiling. Mental health day. Forget about it. If you're bleeding, get stitched up we'll see you in an hour. If you're dying, we would like a note from the local coroner before dinner service please. With all this being said, the best people in the world are the ones that serve slash cook your food. Be kind, tip well and for god's sake be thankful that you didn't get the calling to want to work in the faking kitchen. Edit, some words. Registered nurse in a hospital. You point s. On the outside social media glorifies this profession beyond belief. It's common to see pictures of nurses who are happy and glowing, or beautifully exhausted after a long shift of holding grandma's hand as she peacefully passes away. That rarely happens. I mean maybe twice in a career. Nurses are conditioned without realizing it to talk about how much they love this profession all, while endlessly beaching about how much they hate this profession from the nurse station. Why it sucks. Picture this. For 13 hours, they say 12 hour shifts, it's not, each shift you are tasked to meet the needs of 2 to 6 patients depending on your speciality. Every time single decision you make, is questioned by staff, patients, and families. You cannot do a single thing longer than 2 minutes without being interrupted by an alarm, usually a pointless alarm, or family member who is asking the same faking question you answered 20 times. Oh and your Kaorka Karen wants to talk to you about her shitty husband the entire time. Ah. The only way to do this job correctly and improve the experience for the patients is to break the rules and risk getting fired. The entire career of an RN is living in a grey area of ethics and policy. Example, you tripped and fell six months ago on a branch in your yard. You are now full risk. Because of that, I can't let you sheet alone to prevent you from falling it doesn't matter if you ran a marathon yesterday. If I leave, and god forbid you trip on your underwear, I'm written up, I have an hour of paperwork, meetings, etc. 
As for you, you just won yourself more alarms, more barriers, decreased privacy. Hospital admin will preach about improving nurse autonomy all, while rolling out a new set of rules restricting what we are allowed to do. The workload for our ends is completely, unapologetically, unrealistic. You are expected to tackle that workload, while you're short-staffed, and equipment that fails all, while not killing anyone. You are the whipping post of the entire patient hospital experience. Patients, doctors, and hospital admin all blame you when something doesn't go right, even when it is entirely not your fault. You are expected to navigate that, and keep patient satisfaction up. Everybody expects you to just handle sheet outside of work. You are so exhausted from doing favors for people our work, that you get on autopilot. When you clock out, and get home you are too tired to enforce boundaries with loved ones, so you continue to do favors for them without even realizing it. It conditions them, and the cycle repeats. This career is extremely hard on your mental and physical health. Not because of the gory sheet you see, but because of the constant onslaught of being faked with at every turn. Mainly by hospital admin, staffing office, fac you staffing office. For real, fac you, and patients family members. I can easily type another 10 paragraphs about this faking career, but you get the point. Franchise hotel agent, specifically third shift, never got the chance to work first and second. Managers only care about the ratings that corporate gets to see and will do anything for a five star rating. They will punish you often by threatening random punishments including pay deductions which is illegal. Guests are even more entitled than customers in retail. They will cite damn near anything to try and get a free room. The worst excuse I heard was the guest wanted an immediate refund because he couldn't sleep on the bed as it was too lumpy it had been less than an hour of arrival. He quickly protested me checking the room which there were used condoms on the floor and red lipstick on the white comforter. No refund. You can get sexually harassed every night and your boss will do nothing because you are being too nice to them or they desperately need the business of one person in a packed hotel. I've also been assaulted a couple of times. Drunks slash druggies will also piss and cheat on the elevator and also strip in front of you. This has happened on more than one occasion. You also get people who bring in bed bugs and will live with them in the extended stays for months and not saying a word which leaves rooms unable to be used for days after the person finally leaves. Woman used our rags for her infant's diapers. We ended up calling CPS because with the bed bugs and filth in the room we were legit worried about their child. Finally being screamed at that your breakfast bar isn't open at 3 in the morning. There is also a nod feeling when you meet the spouse of someone who's staying with you demanding room numbers to catch their lover in martial affairs or ones who question a 200 charge in their account that haven't realized their partner is cheating on them, but you can't give much information than what's provided on the slips. There are some upside when guests buy you food or presents, but it doesn't take away the fact some seriously messed up stuff happens. Also if an extended stay tells you they never had bed bugs, they are lying. Edit grandma. Playing music professionally. Even if you're in the top 1% driving in a private tour bus and staying in nice hotels, you're still on the road for months or, oftentimes, years at a time. That means no family, no friends, no structure point. If you're one of the less fortunate ones, like I was, you'll spend 8 months or more at a time living in a 12 passenger van with 4 other smelly dudes. You'll eat lunch meat sandwiches, drink a ton of soda, and feel gross all the time because you haven't had a healthy home cooked meal in months. Every penny you make will most likely go to paying your cell phone bill. So you can call your girlfriend slash wife slash mom slash etc. Because that will be the only way you'll be able to maintain contact with the ones you love. Good luck paying for an apartment or a house on a musician's salary. You'll sleep on an air mattress if you're smart. You'll sleep on the floor if you're stupid. Sometimes you'll be staying at a loyal fan's house. But most of the time you'll be at a truck stop or rest area off of a busy highway. You'll be at the mercy of the element. You'll love the fall and springtime more when the temperature is comfortable. But in July or January, you'll thank God himself for every nanosecond you're in a climate-controlled building. But hey, at least you have the love of the music right. And the girls. Don't forget about the girls lining up to touch your naughty bits. Well, wrong to both. 
Your producers and label people will trash talk you at every turn. They'll tell you your new record isn't good enough, despite the fact that they'll take 70 to 90% of the earnings on album sales. You'll constantly be threatened, insulted, coerced, and ridiculed by the people that were really sweet to you up until you signed the dotted line. Oh, and women won't scream your name or hit on you after the show unless they're 13. So, unless you want to be a part of the must stay X amount of feet away from a school club, you'll need to behave yourself. And you'll also notice a lot of the bands you tour with don't care if they are underage or not. So prepare to hate a lot of dudes for being creepy. And if you're a girl, prepare to be metaphorically pelted with dicks at every turn. Sorry ladies. Concert goddess are thirsty. Source was in a sign banged for nearly 10 years. Had a record deal with a label that rhymes with prick Tory records quit because of the aforementioned list. Now work in info secretary. Electrical engineer slash working in telecommunications. For telecommunications if you trip on one cable half of the faking city's internet connection drops, the radio cuts out, etc. You have to work quick because you have a limited time frame. When the antennas are turned off, they are harmful only when you're standing in extremely close proximity to extremely powerful ones. You usually work in cheaty locations and cheaty situations, like one day you get sunburned on top of a faking apartment building while installing a new cooling system for the servers, the next day you are vacuum cleaning a server cabinet on top of a faking hill in the middle of but fat nowhere, another day you're repainting the container for the antenna stand sheet sucks, and even when you're off work, you are still in work, since most of the time you're on your computer refreshing the status page for all of the connections. Electrical engineering is a constant saw survival game. You touch two wires in a wrong way, and you're faking dead without even realizing what happened. My friend was in a situation where he had to repair a fuse box while he was waist deep in a flooded basement with a bunch of wires hanging out of it. That's why the job is paid so good, you put your life on the line daily. And if you're working as an auditor, then not noticing one fatal, yet small and barely noticeable flaw in the house's wiring is going to cost you your job, a sheet of money, and you're probably going to the jail. You also have to put up with people doing dumb sheet like plugging multiple extension cords in series, people bribing you, etc. Working with electronics sucks, but pays well. Oh, and I forgot about programming. Some sheet goes down, and you literally have to go through thousands of lines of code just to find that one typo, and you find out that it was just one stupid faking bracket in a function that is barely going to be used. I'm talking the Chernobyl's as 5 button type of sheet. Trucking. You'd think moving goods from point A to B would be simple, right? Moving on. BJ and the bear. Smokey and the bandit, all these good old boy jackers blazing down the road having a ball, right? None of them are delivering freight. None of them are sitting on the guardrail wearing handcuffs while smoke em up bear is tossing your truck looking for heaven knows what. They don't show the days, weeks, even months where you're living in a metal slash plastic slash fabricless box. Living in isolation, eating crap food, being treated worse than you'd treat a dog. Being told you can't use the bathroom because some other bozo wrecked it, meanwhile holding you up for hours while you're loading slash unloading. Family life. What family? You're never home when bad stuff happens and you're needed, or the good stuff you'll enjoy. Sometimes working for crap pay, but you're keeping America moving, right? You may never actually go hungry, but you had better like fast food and roller dogs. It's a living, and one of the few occupations you can get into with minimal education, and make okay money. In exchange you'll be a slave to the demands of your company and their customers, especially in the beginning of your career. Don't even mention all the laws and regulations you have to comply with. The customers who don't care about getting you processed because, when it's all said and done, they're clocking out at the end of their shift. They're going home, eating their own food, sleeping in their own bed, and when they clock back in, there you are, still sitting, waiting, hungry and probably stinky, because you didn't get a nice hot shower. Now, can I interest you in a new career in trucking? Sign on the line and we'll have fresh meat in the seat, for a while, until we screw you over, and burn you down. And when you wear out, or break wheel sheet can you, and get another noob. It's easy. Everyone knows truck drivers are a dime a dozen. Rant over. 
I work as lead creative for a company that designs and works with overseas manufacturing to produce toys, kids clothing and home decor items for retailers. I like my actual work, but the pay is shitty, because this type of work is uncommon where I live and everyone wants this job, and is willing to downgrade their pay to get in, thus devaluing a job over time. This gig paid 40% more 15 years ago. That combined with a competitive market with online retail, buyers are demanding more for less money, and foisting more work on us, because they are all stretched so thin, that they can't do it themselves. Managing egos is a huge part of the job, biting my tongue, and managing expectations when an inexperienced 25 year old assistant buyer is demanding anthropology quality items on a Walmart budget, is an exhausting part of the job. People constantly critiquing your work, because everyone wants to be creative, and play the designer, everyone from the accountant to the warehouse guy has to give their opinion on what you design. The rest of the time I beg factor is in China, to make less shitty looking product, people that are working crazy hours, that certainly do not give a shit, that the buyer demands 3000 sets of PJs be redyed a lighter shade of pink than they had approved, because they are too scared about every decision they have to make. And for all this cost me a really expensive art education, that totally broke me financially for a long time, going to school with a bunch of rich kids whose parents paid their way, and will get ahead of me through family contacts. Then having to live in a major, re, expensive, city because all the work contacts are here, and making garbage money 4 years in a shacky industry, it took me 10 years to pay off schooling, that I honestly didn't need that much of, but is demanded on the resume. I'm 40, and live in a cool trendy area, with a lawyer rumored. At least people at parties, are always impressed about what I do, so I guess that's good. Software engineering. Everyone and their mother tells people to learn to owe these days, because they see it as an easy job, that makes tons of money. Competition for the best jobs is insane and many people feel the need to cram into Silicon Valley, New York City, Seattle and other extremely tight job markets in high cost of living areas. Even if you avoid that trap you have to deal with today's job market largely being contract to hire, which honestly is mostly a fancy phrase for temp work. Most companies have no intention to hire you, but will extend your contract repeatedly. Even if you land a full-time job, many places expect one aid person to do the job of two or three people, because the salaries are expensive, and they don't want to hire the right size team. They invented buzzwords like full stack and evops to justify combination of jobs. Even if you find a good full time job, it still sucks. Sales and business people literally don't care about it, and just dump problems on us. Typically problems they have created. They also don't care to listen about level of effort or time to do certain tasks. You'll often be held to deadlines that are unrealistic, and set by business people who have no idea how difficult something actually is to do. Advertising. Not quite the hellhole some other careers seem to have, but it's high on the glamour. You think it's Don Draper, with day drinking and walking into the office, to have a few quick creative ideas, before going to Cannes for a couple of days in the sun. You better really enjoy PowerPoint, and be good at it. Doesn't matter if you're client service, creative director or head of planning. PowerPoint is the main output of every agency I've worked with. Have wonderful ideas. Truly magical life changing ideas. But be prepared for the 24 year old marketing assistant who has been working for a year to tell you they hate them and need to instead create the ad that they suggest. This ad will 100% not work. Very few bagads get made in 2020. Mostly we make social media posts. These are presented in PowerPoint. There is a horrid cycle in advertising where the current senior creative directors were emotionally abused when they were juniors. So they abuse their juniors. And in 20 years they will abuse their juniors. Rinse and repeat. This is done to show your commitment to the work. Bro, we are making an advert for a pasta brand, not saving lives. The politics suck. Your creative director will hate the head of planning, because they said they can't do a TV ad. Then everyone hates the media guy, because Facebook just took them on a 7 day trip to Seychelles for the latest ad trends seminar, but it's really just a giant booze fest. When the media guy gets back, he'll tell us all to make Facebook posts to show our support. 
Everyone hates client service because they say no to everything and suck the client stick. Clients hate client service because they see them as incompetent. Your promotion, raise or firing will be determined by an accountant in London, Dubai, New York or Hong Kong. Your local agency can be the best in the group, but because the South American office didn't reach their target, no one in the global agency can have a raise. The CEO and ECD will get a raise. It's not the full hellscape others have described, but there is far more glamour around joining a hive of great creative minds than the fact that you're just working in a standard office with a standard desk, standard coffee, standard politics and standard clients. The difference is that you make designed facebook posts and other office workers deal in excel. Advertising and graphic design. In my own experience, no overtime pay, but excessive overtime is both common and expected. Retrenchments come round every few years with alarming regularity. Ironic since there is a tendency for ad agencies to tell staff things, like we're one big family. Regarding the above, many bigger agencies are owned by holding companies like Havas, Omnicom, WPP or Publicis. This means that your specific agency has to consistently meet sales targets and financial quotas with the holding company before any new hires can be made. If targets aren't met then it's retrenchment time yay. Clients tend to ignore solid ideas backed by well-researched strategy and design in favor of their own subjective likes and dislikes. Politics politics politics, fueled by huge egos clashing, endless reverts, lots of alcohol and partying, and a strong drinking culture. Almost as if the free alcohol is meant to take the place of overtime pay. Open plan offices. Introverts nightmare. Speaking of introverts, or generally quiet people, the ad industry is full of big personalities. If you're the quiet arty type, you might struggle to get your voice and ideas heard. As a creative you hope to work on cool and interesting projects at least some of the time. However the majority of the time you're designing social media posts, web banners, powerpoint templates etc. And they're all due yesterday. When you do get to work on a cool brief, either your budget is insanely low, or you have a ridiculously tight deadline or both. Of course these two factors could potentially give rise to especially creative solutions. Creative burnout. Constantly being creative on a deadline can be highly unsustainable if you don't pay attention. All the coffee, tequila and lack of sleep add up. Not to mention sitting in a chair hours on end. TLDR, it's an unpredictable, whirlwind industry with lots of parties sometimes and sometimes it's an endless grind of social media posts and late nights. Vet tech. I'm talking about the technician, not the actual veterinarian. Same field, but job is so different from one another. Anyway, it's not playing with kittens and puppies all day or even saving lives. It says a lot of crap to deal with from owners. Owners always beach about price and everyone seems to think veterinary care should be free. Plus, pets can be as holes. Dogs do and will bite you as you're trying to draw blood for a blood panel. A dog will express an all glands on you when you clip its nails. You think a cat wants to hold still while you're taking x-rays? No it will scratch the hell out of you as you pull his extremities to get the perfect x-ray picture and the asshole owners. My dog got vaccinated why did he still get parvo? They would bring in a dead pet and get pissed we'd have to charge them to dispose of their body. Oh, and speaking of body, I bag dead pets several times a week. We had a huge freezer full of dead dogs and cats. Every vet does. On top of caring for pets, you're also responsible for ordering supplies, cleaning. You clean sheet and piss every day. Think of s dog cage full of bloody runny diarrhea. Yeah, this is several times a week. And the pay. By god the pay. One vet I worked for would actually pay his technicians $8 an hour. This was in 2015. For me, mostly, the pay was between 10 to 11 an hour. I did it for 5 years. I had a degree. No benefits. No insurance. No job security. Really. I knew a 50 year old lady who developed a bad back because she had 20 years of lifting heavy dogs. No thanks. I actually make more working at a call center. But everyone is always thinking it's such a fun, noble job and actor Dell was some monster who wanted a job with better pay. LMAO. This is the easiest question I ever had to answer. Veterinary technician and veterinarian. Completely glorified. 
Animal lovers are truly empathetic people. We wear our heart on our sleeves. The vet field is a creature that will turn even the most innocent and sweetest person into a cynical bitter individual. I've seen it happen, and it happened to myself, something I did not think was possible. I knew indeed what I was signing up for, but I thought it would make me content and I did not think I would burn out, because vet med was simply my passion. I just did not think it would happen to me. Needless to say, I've left the field. You show up early, you leave late. Long hours. Poor management. Always understaffed because people get tired and quit. High turnover rate. Underappreciated, underpaid. Even worse if you hate the veterinarian you work with, or they treat you like trash. The profession is not for the faint of heart or easily discouraged but even then, at some point, something has got to give. How resilient you are truly does not matter in the end, because everyone, at one point or another, will experience genuine burnout. You just get tired of the sheet. The things that made you happy, or made the career worth it just does not exist anymore and sooner or later, you are wondering why you are even waking up to go to work in the first place. Damn the bills, financial responsibilities, the team that needs you. It is a mentally and physically exhausting field, and I do not recommend it to anyone, especially animal lovers. But like myself, people have to try it and experience for themselves. I was a hip-hop journalist for 8 years. I rode for both major and small outlets and got to go to any concert, listening party and historical music event I could dream of. I had moments with my favorite artists that came straight out of a dream. It's not as commonly discussed amongst those who want to be in that position how vastly underpaid we are, how our end of the industry is essentially dying or becoming completely undervalued due to social media and short-end attention spans, and how completely unstable it is. The 5am deadlines, after going to a party that lasted until 3am, where you had to take constant notes and quotes to make sure you didn't miss anything for the recap piece due at the crack of dawn. Getting paid pennies for it, balancing 3 to 4 other outlets at a time just to make rent alone. And there was also making one little tiny slip up on an article, and the artist chewing you out through email or social media. The amount of angry people in my messages and mentions over something as simple as posting a track list in the wrong order was pretty unreal. And don't get me started on how disgusting the politics are, the horrible misogyny and sexual harassment, assault is also very common and very covered up. How they screw young artists daily with zero remorse, how you have to consider giving up certain morals to produce a good story, act a clickbait, and not hard journalism, since that's what gets read more. I could do an entire novel on how this industry so many would give their limbs for is so toxic and truly not for everyone. MSP, Managed Service Provider. Basically an outsourced department for companies too small to have in-house its staff, or maybe they have one guy who's good at computers, that will make your life a living hell. I see a lot of help desk guys on here who want to move up into the MSP world. I worked for a consulting company in the dot com era, and we had some great adventures in the wild wild west of the internet, but when the crash came I got laid off, and thought it would be a great idea. To start my own company and do the same thing I was doing, but for twice the money or more. I picked up some small clients pretty quickly and got a few techs to help me out, but I came to realize that these small businesses were more of a pain in the ass than it was worth. Every little thing that happens, no matter how trivial, is somehow your fault and boy do they love to point fingers. And you're always on call, getting phone calls at midnight, because the CEO can't figure out how to set Outlook to online mode or some sheet. When the Great Recession hit, and one of my guys stole a bunch of clients, I let everyone go, and changed my focus to project-based consulting for larger company. Mostly cloud migrations and enterprise exchange and SQL servers these days and I absolutely love it now. I work from home typically 3 days a week, I have one client that I've had for 13 years with a staff of 4 it guys, I come in twice a week, report to the id director, and do a bunch of stuff the in-house guys don't have the skill set for. Long story short, if you want to go off on your own in it do not try to be the id guy for small companies. Set your sights higher, working for the larger companies not only pays more, and more consistently, you'll be so much happier. I can only speak of one to my personal knowledge. 
I am retired now, but I went from computer operations to computer debt management, then to fruit and veg importing and sales, to insurance legal work, with a smattering of various office work in between. This was so higgledy piggledy, because we went through two recessions in there, and redundancies caused cheat. So which is the problem? Audio engineering or working in a recording studio specifically? Whilst I was made redundant during the early 90s, I decided to go to university to learn something I wanted to do and fact the chance of a job. I knew at that time I had no interest in going into the industry to work myself. So I got plenty of horror stories from friends I made. Some of it may have changed now, but it token a lot hasn't. This is an account from just one of my friends. Firstly, pay. In those days, because it was a dreamlike job, getting in at a studio often meant working as a t-boy or go for four no pay until dead man's shoes made you go for some opportunity that made you get a paying job there. If that isn't cheaty enough. Next, going up to tape operator. Yes, I know tape. Minimal pay and stupid hours all, just to do the dog's body work of the studio owner or whatever producer is in session. It could be really sheety, especially if the guy's a dictator as was not uncommon. Of course, the summary of this part is that working sheet unreasonable hours with not much money means socializing is dead. Kind of ironic considering the work. But then you add on top the sheet from ignorant artists who think their sheety equipment is the best and it's your fault it sounds sheet on tape. Or the band members that don't turn up or on time. Or the band members that turn up drunk and expect a drink in the control room who promise they won't spill anything and immediately do. And so on. It ain't glamorous. It's hard work and detailed work, and it's a combination of technical know-how, science, electronics, and being a psychologist and carer. Entertainment industry, movie slash TV slash music videos, etc. Hands down. Working in all weather, except high winds and lightning, in both cases we just wait until it passes. I've personally worked outside through heavy rain, hail, sleet, snow, blizzards, extreme heat, extreme cold, days, nights, thick mud, earthquake, was on a ladder even, etc. Basically everything. Average work day is 12 hours, not including any commute to and from said slash location which can be hours each direction. I've worked days, nights, splits, day into night, fraterdays, starting work on a Friday and ending sometime on Saturday because there's no need to end at a reasonable time since it doesn't affect the next shoot day, Monday. Sometimes people will work 6 or 7 day weeks and then do it all over again. Or the shifted work schedules that give you Monday and Tuesday off or some other random 2 days since they need to film in a super busy place on a weekend because during a weekday would interrupt too many people's work schedules and i've worked up to 16 to 17 hours in a day i know people that have worked over 24 hours continuously music videos it's a joke after 14 hours there's reminiscing productivity and big increases in dangerous accidents the accountants have figured out that the break-even point to working one day with overtime or splitting it to two days is 14 hours. Sleep deprivation is real and it's dangerous. I see it all the time on set. I've been so tired on set I've fallen asleep standing up during a take. The only way to avoid that is to keep moving. Don't stand still. So many people have fallen asleep at the wheel and died or gotten in serious accidents. Even more have fallen asleep behind the wheel but woke up in time to avoid an accident. There's even at least one documentary about this specific problem, titled Who Needs Sleep? I've had a variety of injuries including stitches to my face plus other head trauma including a concussion, broken teeth, metal tools dropped in my head, plus other incidents to my body, scrapes, cuts, splinters, burns, huge wall falling on me knocking me over, nerve damage from a different crushing incident partial toe crushing from hydraulic piece of metal, etc. Both my fault tired, made mistakes, as well as someone else doing something accidentally to me. And you know what a lot of people say when they find out I work in this business? Oh, you're so lucky. That must be so fun. Some people actually think we just hang out all day, smoke cigars, drink martinis, party, etc. Point and how exciting to be working outdoors and not be stuck in a climate controlled office. And all the free food we get, you know, 
for trading our life every waking hour in a thankless position where we don't feel we make enough money but all of the benefits and flexibility are amazing that's why i stay and blowing up and smashing cars I'm still new to it, but working on a film set is both super rewarding and a gigantic pain in the ass. On one hand, it's great to get experience and familiar with how frantic the pace can be, since you're often in go 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 mode with locking down certain shots in an orderly fashion. On the other, a lot of it ends up being a waiting game if you aren't a DP, a camera assistant, or working with the sound slash lighting department. The hours can also be incredibly long. I think the shortest has been 8 hours and the longest was from 2 slash 3 pm to 10 am the next day. As a PA, it's been a lot of either sitting around waiting for someone to ask for assistance with something, or being sent out to run errands if you aren't placed somewhere specific. I think the last night of shooting for something I helped out on, I either spent most of my time in a motel room with the MacUke department with another PA, because we weren't needed for a specific shot, or I was sent out with said PA, to go on a run, to pick up stuff for craft service. It's not exactly a thing, where you're sitting around with your thumb up your ass, but it can be wicked boring at times, if you're with half the crew in one location and the rest are filming miles down the road, especially if you're doing night shots, and it would be pitch black outside, if the lighting rigs weren't on. Oh, and getting there can be half the adventure too if you aren't familiar with the area and you don't have clear, or specific information, when it comes to things like parking and unloading. I recall me, the aforementioned PA and a few other crew members trying to figure out where to park near this field in middle of nowhere type of area, and spent an hour or so just talking to each other, while we waiting for someone with a truck, to come get us in a series of trips to avoid, having too many cars backed up on a single dead end dirt road. A mutual of mine has worn multiple hats in the indie scene, so he's had similar experiences with how hectic things can get as a director, producer, writer. PA, actor, and so on. I recall him telling me, when he worked on a set, he and a few other crew members had to set up a dolly for a specific shot, and it got faked up, because there was a minuscule dip, or bump in the pavement, that messed the shot up, after working on it for so long. He also said, that he got paired with a lot of lazy PAs who wouldn't do much, and get to verbally kick them in the pants, to help clean up the corridor before the crew in the other room wrapped up filming before moving there. It's some sheet, and that's only with low budget, independent productions. I can only imagine how much of a clusterfuck it is to work on bigger budget, Hollywood level sets, because of the time crunches. Anything dealing with being a vet vet tech, or working in a vet office. I once worked in a emergency pet hospital as a desk secretary, not registered as a tech or doctor, where I could do procedures or even touch the animals. But everyone thought I spent all day playing with kittens and puppies. Hell no. I've held a 195 pounds Great Dane while it had a grand mal seizure. Been throw up and pooped and pisses on by dogs and cats. Ran from the parking lot to the air table with a dog split in half after being hit by a car and dragged. That was a messy one. One time a little girl no more than seven brought in a box full of half dead kittens that her dad stomped to death as punishment because she didn't clean her room. I had to check each one to sort out the ones that were gone, not going to make it or worth saving all while she is hysterical. The front desk person is mainly the gatekeeper to Watridge, will take straight back or have wait if there are dire animals that need to be seen as soon as possible. I feel like the worst is when I've had to bring my pets in to work to be put down. I was always the one to go into a room and either break the news or ask what type of service they will want, cremation or taking the body with them. I was always so dedicated to make sure the owners knew we cared and we were there. I still get sad thinking about that job. Super gratifying but mentally exhausting. <laughs> Journalism. Obviously, some of this comes from my own experiences, but, abysmal pay for insane amounts of work. Getting paid overtime ever is a fever dream. If you think lawyers have sheet personal lives, hang out with a journalist. Alcoholism and crumbling mental health abound. Just the stress alone of the job on an unlivable wage is enough to make you unhinged. Totally rewarding to write something that makes a difference, but you'll likely have lumpy, failed their way to the top editors or powers that be forcing you to write nonsense 
to get web traffic slash clicks as a last ditch effort to stop hemorrhaging money. Depressing, routine layoffs, then, doing the work of 8 people instead of 4, because there's a forever hiring freeze. People go into journalism, because they value the truth, and want to make a difference. Working for a publication, that will crush stories to not alienate advertisers, or partake in any unethical practices, will disillusion you immediately. Still wanting to make a difference, and loving what you do at heart, but being limited, disillusioned, financially struggling and having no work-life balance is a real dream crusher. Any dissent about failing, practices is met with an attitude, that you just don't have the marksy, or aren't tough enough. In some newsrooms I worked in, it felt like abuse and toxicity was applauded. And that's in addition to everyone calling you fake news, attacking you in Facebook comment, or leaving screaming voice emails because they didn't like your story. Actor slash singer slash model slash dancer, 99% of us are faking broke, was coerced into this profession by someone who's connected and then dumped when we couldn't make them money. We are told constantly that there is always people better than us and we can be replaced whenever. Majority of producers and directors feel that our talent isn't worth paying us for, demand we work for free, and if you don't accept the job on their terms, you're fired. Someone else will take the job and will be better than the garbage you brought to the table. There's far too many of us, and the market is saturated with people who think it's easy and is only looking to be the next Kardashian, so they take jobs with sheety deals, unaware of industry politics, and this encourages producers slash directors to treat their talents like faking sheet. Treat background actors or unknown actors with speaking roles like crap just to give a celebrity special treatment and pretend they're friends with said celebrity. I've literally been threatened by some rando PA on set. She yelled at us to not touch the food on set until we got back to holding, which was 15 blocks away, signed out, and then we were allowed to come back to set for food, but only with our papers proving that we were released. And then she followed up with, if you touch the food before you prove you were released, you will be penalized. And this was after working 10 hours non-stop and then being shooed away aggressively from the crafts snacks, table by 5 PAs during our 15 minute break. Law enforcement. People get into it thinking it's going to be exciting and fulfilling and that you'll make a difference. But to start, it is an absolute nightmare to just get hired. It is absolutely soul sucking and they treat you like a criminal with a huge integrity problem the entire way through. Everything is a red flag, if you've ever been divorced, had a significant other break up with you, if you ever were fired or laid off, if you've ever been in car accident, if you've even dinged someone's car, when you opened your door, even if you left a note, if you have any debt, if you've ever committed even a minor crime, if you even know somebody who committed a crime. Basically, anything bad that happened if your life, whether it was your fault or not, will be considered your fault and you without excuse. When you get on the job, you'll find it's not worth it. There are bad officers out there, but the public these days considers every last cop to be the scum of the earth. You'll be hated by the public and thrown under the bus by the government. We were told in the police academy do the right thing and you'll be fine. Nope, you can find yourself fired and arrested, even if you behaved completely legally and within policy, if it's politically convenient. You'll also find yourself in a toxic work environment where nobody likes each other. Everybody hates rookies with a passion, even if they are good, and you'll be tired constantly as you'll likely be working double shifts, midnights, etc. Most of your calls are going to be bullshit. Neighbors arguing over loud music, a manhole cover open, parents who don't discipline their kids, fender benders, etc. Frankly, the job is mind-numbingly boring most of the time. Even when it's difficult, it's often uninteresting. The cool sheet you see on TV is like maybe 1% of it. By the time you're on the job long enough to do cool stuff like investigations, SWAT, you're often already so jaded by the job that it ceases to be exciting or fulfilling. Considering that it takes 6 months to a year or more to get hired for a job where you work terrible hours with terrible people, it's not worth it. Not exactly a glamorized career path, but anything in the service of good ol' Uncle Sam. Everything good or bad about the military is wholly based on where you're stationed and who your command team is. 
that sheet flip flops too. Plus it's not like you can just quit and go somewhere else. So you sign up between ages 18 to 24 and your first contract and you're thinking to yourself hey, that wasn't too bad. I could do this again. You find yourself signing another contract and moving to a different duty station. Next thing you know you spend less than 30% of your term at home around the family and without a cell to boot. Plus sheet pay, granted they always hype the benefits. But let's be real and talk about these so-called benefits. Every doctor I ever saw in the military treated everything with either 800mg ibuprofen or 400mg naprexin. If your doc hated helping people even a little bit. If you needed actual care it'd take months to convince them that something is actually wrong with you and that you're not trying to sham your duty i.e. back pain, knee pain and any sort of mental issue. You finish your contract and now you're in your mid-twenties to thirties with chronic back or knee pain, addiction to or resistance to pain meds, because you drowned in like candy to get through it all. No savings, because most military families have to live paycheck to paycheck in my experience. Terribly run down on post housing that'll gouge a fuck out ta yap when you move out. Out of date and downright broken height and weight standards that force a lot of actually fit people out of the military, and after it all depending on your MOs you'll retire, or just get out, and find out that the real world has no use for any of your skills. Also to boot regardless of whether you were a medic or a truck driver even people with those skills had to get retrained in the civilian world because the methods are different. Disclaimer, this doesn't apply to everyone obviously, some people have fruitful careers in the military my experience tends to lean towards the opposite, I served 6 years active duty with the US Army and was honorably discharged. Everything I learned I'm thankful for and I wouldn't change the bonds I built with my comrades. But I know a ton of guys who got out who couldn't get good paying jobs or they were just too beat to do work they were used to. I was lucky and managed to find a place who'd take me in and teach me everything without any prior knowledge in their industry. People on TV. I work with some people who are on a popular morning show here in Canada. A lot of the time they're burning the wick at both ends 5am mornings on the regular and during award shows it's even crazier. Some of these guys wake up at 5 and then hop on a plane to stand on a red carpet for 5 to 7 hours. To cover an award show or to fly back to Canada to start the week over again. I work with a guy who has to stay up until 11 p.m. so he can watch all of the sports that are airing just to be back on set at 5 a.m. to give recaps and help host in the morning. Another one for me is the film industry. I'm a professional Mac Youp artist and we are on set generally the earliest and we leave last after we take off the makeup from the talents. 16 hour days is the norm, most of the time you're starting at noon and working until 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning standing around waiting for something to happen or someone to need you. When you apply for a union other Mac Youp artists will warn you, if you want to work in film you have to accept the fact that you will have no social life while you're working. Both of these industries pay well, and it's incredibly cool and rewarding to be a part of something like this and to work on set. However, because the public only sees the best of the job, people think it's just some glamorous and easy thing. It's a lot of fun most of the time, but it's not always the case. You just don't see it, unless you're behind the scenes. Not sure if nursing isn't here, but nursing. People think it's this beautiful job, where you save lives and you are important. You work to make people better. You work with doctors and you see amazing things. Yes, there is that. You also watch people suffer and die. You keep people alive who are suffer and are in so much pain because the family just cannot let go. You see families that are just awful. Young kids and teens dying and you cannot help them. Doctors who are just so full of themselves that they cannot see past their own noses. You get blamed for things a doctor should have done, what the lab should have done. You didn't clean the room. You didn't turn the patient on time, you didn't feed the family, you didn't wipe the ass of the 25 year old who can actually do everything themselves, but they are in a hospital you have to do it, you didn't find the ketchup that was missing on the try, you didn't update the whiteboard and the best is that after 12.5 hours you didn't put in extra time to get education completed or go to the after work function so that you can really get to know everyone and be the best team ever. 
I hear all the time at least you only work 3 days. I do over 40 hours in 3 days. I have to go back to work for meetings, education and the ever loving extra champion bullshit. Because as someone who is a nurse you should give all your time to the hospital and the unit. Heaven forbid you have a negative attitude when you are short staffed in an IQ and you have to be the extra nurse. 8. Housekeeping. Third shift doesn't have a housekeeper. And huck while all the while doing your own job and listening to the night doctor just to have the day shift doctor scream and how incompetent you are because you listen to the night shift doc and not them. But don't call them because you could be fired. Ah. But the sexy scrubs that have pee, poop, vomit, secretions, blood, makes it worth it, or the paycheck that pays for the schooling you have to do and continue to do because the government states that you have to keep going or you can be fired. I don't know if it is glamorized, but working in social development, human upliftment such as violence prevention, poverty alleviation etc. It is absolutely soul destroying to see money wasted on pointless things that could really be used to make a long term difference in people's lives donors driven by egos who are more interested in certain good PR opportunities for themselves than actually investing on communities in the long term. NGO workers earning low salaries because they back quote do it out of the goodness of their hearts most of the really competent people are in the for profit sector so you really mostly can recruit only the inexperienced, the incompetent and the lazy massive international organizations, no names, meant to be driving social change but really just spend huge money on administration, fat salaries and logistics. Beating your head against a wall trying to get government to work with you in that way that actually produces decent service delivery for the needy and does not involve corruption, maladministration, public service indifference and wasted resources. NGOs refusing to collaborate with one another because they are compelled to be competitive in nature due to limited funds. NGO being forced to dip into funder raise money to keep the lights on because the other funders did not transfer the promised money. And then said NGO is shut down and all services end because they spent funder as money on funder B's project. Donors just not paying for services as per agreement and the NGO has to pick up the tab with non-existent money, ending in retrenchments and office closures. Trying to hold government to account for failing to deliver basic services and, at the same time, being forced to rely upon government funding to render basic services. After 19 years I really doubt I made any difference in anyone's life. Ranching. I come from a ranching family and it's basically a giant gamble every year. Constant maintenance of the land, monitoring slash feeding slash general care of cattle, fixing fence, watching what the beef market is doing, obsessing over the weather, hoping you have enough saved from a flush year to make it a lean year. It's just constant stress. Also, private slash CRM archaeology, long hours, sheet pay, constant travel, dangerous conditions, and more. Most of your friends are also your cowhawkers because you are literally with them all the time. Alcoholism and other drug use is pretty rampant with most archaeologists being functioning alcoholics. When you start a new job or project, you are often tested to see if they can get you to overlook things and when you won't you are the problem and bad guy. I have been shot at, cussed at, and dealt with a crazy cult that had people spy on us. They were terrible at this as we noticed a car appearing on an empty road and just sitting there. When they were made by us a new car appeared. It was creepy. They also attempted to salt a site again poorly. Most of the time you find nothing and honestly are happy because it means less paperwork and problems. When you do find a site you hope it's not important because if it meets certain criteria you have to tell the client to pick. 1. Go around, rear out, move, pick a new place to put that building slash well pad slash etc. Or 2. Mitigate, pay to have the site professionally excavated. As mitigation is typically the most expensive and lengthiest option we rarely get to actually excavate. So basically when we do find anything awesome it's left, most likely never to be properly excavated. At best sites are left alone and forgotten. At worst they are looted and destroyed. No lie, it's a faking depressing career 